With that being said, if you can open up, let's uh, open up for our teaching tonight. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 27, we're picking up. Seems like it's been forever, but here we are. We're back in Proverbs. So Proverbs uh, chapter 14, verse 27, we're looking at the wise sayings of Solomon. We've been looking at that for a while. Uh, this Proverbs are very important to go through the Proverbs. Why? Because in the Bible, it's known as the book of wisdom. And I know, I guaranteed, if I ask who needs wisdom, I would say everybody's hand would go up. We all need wisdom. We need more wisdom. So this is where we find the wisdom of Solomon, the, the wisest man that ever walked the earth besides Jesus. He, he was a very wise man. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit. So uh, there's a lot of wisdom, but it's all it's practical wisdom. It's good practical wisdom for, for all of us day by day. So we, we get to you know, glean off the wonderful wisdom from Solomon. Not only that, as a reminder, each verse uh, has a complete thought. So we've been looking at that. So here with the ones that uh, we're going to be, all the ones tonight you're going to see, there's a complete thought each verse. So that... What that does, it gives us a lot of different topics to cover, and it's a lot of good practical stuff. So with that being said, you can please stand with me. I'm just going to read one verse, and we're going to dive into this powerful text that's right before us. So again, Proverbs 14, verse 27, Solomon writes, The fear of the Lord is the fountain of, can we say it out loud? Life. Life. To turn one away from the snares of death. death. Lord, here we are. We're wanting to hear you speak. And Lord, primarily we know that you speak through your word, the, the word of God, which is God-breathed. So Lord, open our ears to hear what you have to say. Remove any distractions, Lord, from our thoughts. Remove any distractions that would try to come. And, and uh, we pray that you would just help us to understand what we're reading but Lord, with that, help us to be not just hearers of this word. Help us to do these things. Help us to these upcoming days in front of us to apply these wonderful truths that we'll be reading about here. So bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So here we are. This is, as I just read, verse uh, 27, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of, can we say it again? Fountain of life. Fear... You know, I know the first time I read that in the Bible, I thought, wait, I don't fear God. I'm not supposed to fear him. I love him. And, but it's really, it, it, the root of it really means that we're to respect him, have a reverence for God. You know, to have that, there's a healthy respect that we're gonna, we should have for God. We should respect him and reverence him in such a way where we realize that the things of this world are evil. The things that are, you know, sin, you were to stay away from those things that, that tempt us. And, then, and to realize, wait, wait, I, I reverence God. I respect him. If he says this is wrong, I, I, I want to respect and, and show him reverence. And so, so we see that. I, I know in the world, even I was in this place where I thought, well, if I reverence God, it's not going to be, I'm going to have a lesser life or it's not going to be so fun. Uh, those, those Christians or those churchgoers, they're, they're boring. They just do boring things. All they do is go to church. And it's, they, they, I really thought that. They live a boring life. And I thought I really was living, living it up and it was a fun time and all. But now I realize on the other side, now that I've accepted Christ and I, I, you know, he's, you know, I, show, I reverence him and he's, he, I realize how awesome he is, I realize actually it's an abundant life. And we read this here, when you reverence God, it's a, a fountain of life. And so if you're a note taker, it's a, a fountain is a natural flowing of water, a spring, a well. It's speaking of a life, listen, with joy, peace, love, and purification. So he pours in. When we turn to him and respect him, it's kind of the visual of, of that we reverence him, we respect him. So there's the temptation that comes our way and we're like, no, I'm just going to turn to God. And, and then it, these things that want to allure us or these things that want to take us away from the things of God. We're like, no, 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 I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there where God is. I'm not going to you know, waste my time here. When you do that, it's, it's a fountain of life. There's joy, there's peace. And I, I'm sure most of us here, you've experienced that, the joy of the Lord by hanging out with him, the joy of the Lord that we have, the peace that he gives and, and all that he has, love poured into our hearts. And, and so you, you have... You know, this, you know, his love poured into our lives. He's the source of life itself. So we see that. 
great scripture that goes with it. Jeremiah 17, 13 says, O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be, can we say that? Ashamed. Those who depart from me, the Lord says, shall be written in the earth. That's not us. We're written in heaven. We're written in the Lamb's book of life. Written in the earth is probably talking about in the earth, you know, down to the pits of hell, basically. That's those that depart from the Lord. Because they have forsaken the Lord, can we say this? The fountain of? The fountain of living waters. You want to be, someone once says, be under the sprout where the blessings flow out. Living waters. You be under, you're under the spout where the blessings flow out. In other words, when you turn to him, you reverence him, and you have a life in Christ, the, the, the flowing out of his Holy Spirit's like living waters. He just flows into your life, and he, he pours out. Abundant. And I, I get this, this picture, if you will, that when we, we're like this, God, you're so awesome, and you're, you know, yeah, you know, that stuff, you know, that's my past life. I don't want that stuff. And you're like this, and you're in that place. You're in the, again, the, the, the fountain where the blessings are poured out into your life, and you're, you're under the spout where the blessings are poured out, they say, right? So you are, you're in that place. But the difference is, so when, when you go after the things of the world, there's no more pouring out. There, there's no more way because you're turning away from, from that place. It's, so, so you see that. He's the fountain of living waters. Don't forget that. Jesus said in John 7, 38, he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow what? Rivers of living waters. And you might say, well, what is that? Well, you don't have to guess what it is because he tells us right here. But this he spoke concerning what? The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, whom those who believe in him would what? Receive. But he makes it very clear the Holy Spirit was not yet given when he wrote this, when this, when this, was, put, when this was happening, when Jesus was talking. Why? Because Jesus was not yet glorified. But Jesus is glorified now, so that means that we can receive the living waters flowing out of our lives, flowing into our lives. And so that's a, a reminder for us as we look to the Lord and we reverence him, but look back at that verse. To turn one away from the snare of what? The snare of death. You guys know what that is. It's a trap. Check this out. A trap used with bait for catching animals or a baited hook. So to turn what? When you have reverence and you fear the Lord, it, it turns you away from that snare of death, the, the snare that's there, that trap that the enemy is constantly putting out. So, the, so beware. Guaranteed, there's traps set for us. And guaranteed, the bait that, that's there, it's very attractive. It's attractive. Sin is pleasurable for a season. So, so the, you, the bait, and, but, but to realize the bait, whatever that bait is in your life, then you know what it is. In your mind, you're like, yeah, I know what the bait is. You know what it is. It's the bait. But remember, there's a hook there. And just like when you go fishing, you go to catch, you don't put, you put something on there that's going to attract the fish. They're like, well, what is that? Right? And they're attracted to it. They don't see the hook that's there, right, to, to catch them. All they see is the, the bait, and they're like, and so you move, the, you move it, they're like, I want that, and, and you got them. And if you really get the picture of how the sin works and how it's, it's a bait there, and then there's always a hook to, to pull you what? To pull you away from God. That, that hook is there to pull you away from the things of the Lord, to, to grab hold of your life. So it's a, it's a wonderful reminder. What When you reverence God, you, you, you have a good fear of the Lord. It's a fountain of life. But then the opposite is, if you take the bait, there's spiritual death. If, if you take the bait and, you don't, and you're not a Christian, there's eternal death. There's eternal separation from God. So you, you see that. So I, again, you want to stay if you will, as someone said, under the spout where the blessings flow out. You want to you wanna be in that place. So it's a, a great reminder of us. We serve the God that's a God of living waters that wants to refresh us by his Holy Spirit every day, every hour, every minute. The devil's real. Temptation's real. Day by day, we're going to have this battle of the flesh. It's, what do we, you know, there's this the battle of, are we going to give in to the temptations of this world? Are we going to give in to the flesh? Are we going to give in to what the enemy has there for us? And just a great visual, listen, throughout these next few days, 
look, look at this. You're, there's going to be bait set for you. There's going to be there. Don't take it. Remember this message right now. Remember this word. Don't take the bait. It's a trap. Don't fall into that trap. Don't go back. It might look really good, but there's a hook. And it wants to pull you away from the things of God. And it wants to take you away from the things that are are good and godly and spiritual. It wants to take you away from that wonderful place where God's life is poured out into your life with joy and peace and love and goodness and kindness and all the things that the Holy Spirit has for you, okay? Just a reminder for all of us. Verse 28. In the multitude of people, a king is a king's honor, but in the lack of people is the downfall of a prince. I believe this is speaking about, you know, when there's a multitude of people in a kingdom that usually typically shows that there's good leadership. He's a, it's a good king. He's able to keep the people. He's able to get the people behind him. There's good governing going on and, and all like that. And I believe that's the picture of this. And then the, the contrast, obviously, is that the lack of people for the prince, there's, it's their downfall. If you're not a good leader, you're not going to have people following you. If you're a good leader, people will follow. And so I believe that's what it's talking about. We have to be careful when it comes to spiritual things, though, that we don't always measure things with numbers, though. When you look at this, for the kingdom, for a king in the physical realm, yeah, it's good. Why? You can have a bigger army to bring peace, and it brings, you know, it's a blessing in the land. If you, you, you lead by strength, and then nobody messes with you because you have a huge army, and you're just a good king and a good leader, that's a beautiful thing. But, but, but for the spiritual realm, we have to be careful that we're not so focused on numbers, Think of Jesus. What do you, how many followed him real close? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Let's say eleven because one really messed up. <laughs> that's, that's, that was his close following. It was the eleven. There was twelve there, but only really eleven were there with him. And it's good for us, those that are Bible teachers, those that are you, you know, different ministries. And sometimes you can get too caught up in numbers, and you have to really be careful with that. When the church first started here in Sunset Beach, the Women's Club, first five years, I think we averaged about 30 people, 25, 30 people for, for five years. And I know the Lord, was, the Lord was saying, just be faithful in those be faithful and, you know, if there's one person that's willing to listen to you teach, minister to the one person. If there's five, minister to five. 5,000, minister for 5,000. 100,000, it it's not about, we have to really be careful that, that we're not so caught up in that because it can really mess you up thinking about, oh no, there's not, you know, so yeah, if you're gifted and you have the gifting, make sure that you're gifted in that. Maybe there, there's some people that aren't gifted in certain things and that's why nobody's following because they're not really gifted and God will do that to bring you out and to say, no, no, that's not really the gifting I've called you in. I've called you in this. Remember Pastor Chuck Smith, part of his testimony is he, he tried to be an evangelist. Remember that? And it never worked out for him. Why? He, that wasn't his, his gifting. He was gifted as a pastor teacher to teach the word of God. So it was so frustrating, if you know Pastor Chuck Smith's testimony, to, he tried hard to be that evangelist, and it just wasn't working out. And when he, he realized that his calling was to teach the word of God, and he did, you know, he, there was a powerful anointing on that teaching, and just to see how God blessed that. And so it's always good to know what your calling is. Don't try to be something that God hasn't called you to be. Know your calling, but be faithful. Again, five years. It was it was tough ground. The here in this community, it was it was very, very tough ground. I tell people that the first five years was the growth, but not the church. The growth of my wife and I, to really deal with our hearts. Why are we doing this? Are we doing it for numbers? Are we doing it for Christ? Are we doing it because we're called? Are we doing it because God has shown us this is where we're to be? And so you just I'm looking back on that, and then to see about seven years, then it started expanding, and then we had to we went to the uh, P- Peter's Landing. We were there for 12 years. And then the huge growth, 2000, what, 2020, when everybody was locked down and churches were closed, and we decided, no, we're going to keep the doors open. And then God just really did a special work with that. 
But be faithful in the little things. So we look at this, and yeah, in a physical way for a kingdom and all, but I think for spiritually speaking for us, we need to be careful. We're not so focused on numbers. And great verse that goes with this. Jesus said, he was faithful in what is what? Least is also faithful in what? Much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust in what is much. I believe that's saying, you know, be faithful with whatever God has put in front of you, with the least. If you're faithful with that, then you're going to be faithful when he does decide, if he does decide to bring more or increase in the ministry. Amen? Next verse, 29. He was slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. Slow to wrath. That means anger or fierce anger. That's godly. God himself, we're told in Psalm 145, I think it is. Yeah, Psalm 145, 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to what? Anger and great in mercy. So we're called to, to be that. When, when you are slow to anger, it's a good reminder for us there's great understanding. I don't know about you, the, the times when I've got into, the, if you will, the flesh, I got upset and, you know, just real quick to get upset at something, um, I lose all understanding. In other words, I can't think straight. I, I, it, you know, if, you're, if you're, you have bitterness in your heart, self-seeking, there's confusion and every evil thing's there, you know, so it's a good reminder and just for all of us, and I'm sure every one of us can, can relate to this, before you react, pray. If something's getting you upset... I highly suggest before you open your mouth, pray. Lord, please guard over my mouth right now. I don't know how many times, do you ever just say something and you just spur the moment, it upsets you and it just goes, and you're almost like you want to catch that word that's coming out. You're the words that are you're like, oh no. And guess what? It's too late. And so stop. Slow to anger. Slow to wrath. Pray before you speak. Pray before you respond. Why? That's godly. That's what God, God is slow to anger. He's, he's great in mercy. That's our God. But what else do we have here? But he who is impulsive exalts folly. Impulsive means impatient or short-tempered. Foolishness. I'm sure you're not this way, but have you ever met someone with like a short fuse? None of you guys, I know that, so. <laughs> Just short-tempered. You just, you're, you wait, there's some people that, you know, that are like, oh, well, well, don't. You know, you're like walking on eggshells around them. It's like, you, you don't know what's going to set them off, right? Well, it's foolishness. You know, and so everybody's uncomfortable around that particular person. Why? Because it's not godly. It's not a good thing. And you shouldn't have to be that way around that person. But for all of us, we should not be those people. We have to be careful. We're not short-fused. We're not those that... We are to be more like this. Why? I want to have great understanding. I don't want foolishness. And it's very easy to be foolish if you are quick and impatient. So, great exhortation for all of us. A sound heart is life to the body, a sound heart. But envy is rottenness to the what? Well, if you're a note taker, sound heart, interesting. It means a healthy heart. It doesn't mean the physical heart. We're talking, I believe, you know, our emotions are inside of us. A wholesome heart, listen to this, a yielded heart. It, it basically is a heart without wrath, without anger, without bitterness, without envy. Um, what is that? It's life. Did you notice? To the body. When our heart's right, when we give our Sin to the Lord, and we, we ask the Lord, Lord, take angry, anger out of my heart. Take wrath, bitterness, envy. And, and he starts healing your heart. He starts ministering to your heart. And then it, it's, it's healthy for you. I mean, physically even. Spiritually, it's very healthy for you. It, it, it gives you just, it it's, gives you clarity and peace and all. But even, the, we can prove medically. People that are always angry or always upset, always anxious, they have ulcers, they've got stress problems. They, I mean, all kinds of things can happen. So it's a, it's a great reminder for us. But then this, oh, wait, before we go, I just, 
as I think of this, you know, the getting angry, the heart. Remember when King David, remember when he fell with Bathsheba. Remember Nathan the prophet confronted him. Remember that? Remember Nathan the prophet came, came up with a story. He says, yeah, Dave, David, I want to tell you this story. And he goes, yeah. He says, well, and David thought this was a true story. He says, yeah, there's this real rich man, and then there was this poor man, the neighbor, and uh, the poor person only had one little ewe lamb, and it was like a pet. They, the kids loved it. They, 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 they slept with the pet. They slept with the ewe lamb. They ate the same food and, the, and all, but the rich man had abundance, had whatever he had. Then there was a traveler that came. Remember that? Traveler came, and then so the rich man took the poor man's little ewe lamb and slaughtered it and fed it to the traveler. Remember David? What was, he was angry. He says, that man shall surely die and pay fourfold, right? And remember what Nathan said? David, you're the man. God gave you abundantly. And if you wanted more, he would have given you even more. But you took, you took Uriah's wife and you slept with her. And then you had Uriah to cover your sin. You had an innocent man, Uriah, killed. David, you're that man. And that's when David wrote Psalm 51. Remember that? And what did he say? Lord, create in me a clean heart. His heart wasn't right. A sound heart. Oh God, and renew a steadfast, a right spirit within me. God can change our hearts. God can cleanse our hearts. David fell bitterly. And, and what happened is we see with David's life is so that one sin of, of adultery turned into another sin of murder. And if it didn't stop, it would just would have gone out of control. But he had to be confronted with someone that loved him and says, David, you're wrong. You need to repent. You know, Nathan could have got killed for what he did, but he was loyal to God. But that anger that was there and all that was surfacing out of David being confronted with truth, David says, Lord, create in me a clean heart. Renew a steadfast, renew a right spirit within me. But then the second part of this, I want to... Envy is rottenness to the... Can we say that out loud? That's pretty picturesque, isn't it? Envy, let's, let's, let's look at that word, and then rottenness to the bones. In other words, it affects you deep inside. What, envy? So a definition of envy is an emotion which occurs when a person lacks another's quality, skill, achievement, or possession and wishes that the other lacked it. You lack it. You see it in them. You're like, I wish they lacked it. <laughs> you're envious of them because they're gifted and they've got, and you're like, I don't have that gift. Or usually, typically, it's when you have a gift, but then you notice someone that has a gift that's better than your gift. And you're like, oh, I don't like that person. Why? Because they're better than you. Or God's using it in a better way. And there's, there's envy that can happen. We have to be careful. Why? It, it affects us inside. But, but the word also, also the definition of that word, not just the envy, but there's also jealousy. And we, we need to be careful also with jealousy. It's, it's similar. Jealousy is when you're jealous of somebody. And, you're, and you, so you have to be careful. So there's, a, there's a, a little distinction that's different. But either one, it brings rottenness to the bones. When my wife and I were engaged. It was a short time, by the way. It says eight weeks. We got married in eight weeks. <laughs> We went to a conference in Austria, a missions uh, conference. And here, we were sitting there and listening to the teaching and stuff. It was really good and the worship. And so one night the worship was going on and the worship leader was up there and he kept looking at Kathleen while he was doing the worship. And I'm sitting there like, <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? And I mean, I mean, it was so obvious. He just was like this and like looking at her like this. And, and I'm thinking, I'm sitting right next. I'm thinking, look at the Lord. Why are you looking at my, my, my wife-to-be, really? And I was like, what is going on? And I was like, are you kidding me? So I'm trying to worship, closing my eyes, and I open up my eyes. And he's still, <laughs> and he's still looking at her. And I'm like, what is going on? 
And I was like, okay. I, and so the Bible study after the worship, I didn't understand nothing. Why? Rottenness to the bones. I was, I was, it, was deep, it was hurting me deep inside. Like, what is going on right now? This is not good. And literally all I can think of is, you should have your eyes on the Lord, not on her. And so I'm like, what is that? And so after the the study, I just confronted Kathleen with this. I'm like, what's going on? He's looking at you the whole time. She goes, I don't know. And I said, I know, but I mean, it's so obvious. He wouldn't stop looking at it. Well, looking back now, I didn't see it then. So he knew Kathleen. He knew that she was a very accomplished singer and she's very polished and she can tell if you're off key even a little bit. So I believe now looking back, he was like looking like for approval, like, am I doing okay? Am I doing, I didn't see it that way. All I saw is he kept staring at her the whole time doing worship. I'm like, this is weird. So I'm losing it. No, okay, I just, I did. And I'm being very vulnerable. You might have heard this before, but just being vulnerable. I'm just like, you know, that's just wrong. And I can't believe he did that. And, and she's trying to tell me, I think it's this, I, I don't care. He's just wrong. He shouldn't have done that. I'm getting all upset. I'm just, I'm mad at her. And this is rottenness is surfacing. So listen to this. So I didn't date for five years. This is where the Lord called me not to date. I just, I felt it strongly. So I didn't date. So I used to deal with jealousy in the world, but I didn't deal with it for five years. So now all of a sudden it surfaced out of me and it was ugly. And I was just being mean. I was being ugly. And it's just, this rottenness was coming out and this sin is surfacing out of me. And so you know, I'm dealing with this and I'm talking to her. And then she looked at me with loving eyes, which I've never experienced ever in my life before. She looked in my eyes and she says, please don't leave me. And I've never experienced love like that in my whole entire life, besides from God. And it crushed me. And I knew instantly I was wrong. It was my sin I didn't fully understand the whole picture until later when I, why? Because I, I wasn't thinking rationally. All I, I was just thinking, it was just jealousy had a hold of me. And, and all I can say is that what God put in her heart to say to me, and she meant it, she looked at me like, Are you, please don't leave me. It just crushed me. And it brought me to my knees to say, God, forgive me, my sin. Take this jealousy away from me. I don't want this. It's wrong. It's my fault. And I looked at her, I says, it's not your, this is my fault. This isn't your fault. And I repented. And all I can say is God delivered me from that when I realized and he created in me a clean heart. He renewed a steadfast spirit within me. But it, it needed to get surfaced out of me and I, I needed to see it. I, I didn't have to deal with that jealousy for five years. And when it came up, it came up so fierce and I had to deal with it. I had a choice. I could have looked at it and said, no, it's, this is your fault. But the way that the situation happened and the way that my wife now, she was my fiance at the time, the, the way that the love that she poured out on my life, I've never experienced ever in my life. And it crushed me in a good way. Created me a clean heart, oh God. Because envy is rottenness to the bones. Jealousy is terrible. And God wants to create in us clean hearts and he wants to renew a steadfast spirit in all of us. Amen? Amen. Verse 31. He who oppresses the poor reproaches his what? That's interesting, isn't it? So the word oppress means to defraud, to deceive, to violate, to wrong basically to take advantage. When you take advantage of the poor, you reproach your maker. Reproach means you blaspheme God, you dishonor him, you speak against God. Why? Because we're all made in the image of God. And, and so, I mean, I, as I was kind of looking through this and thinking through this, I think about, like, for example, like sometimes landlords, they're, uh, they don't fix up their, their places, if you will, because... They don't want to put out any money. And so you've got, but they realize the people that are living in their, their house or whatever, their apartments are all, uh, they know that they, they don't have money and they're not going to sue them. And so they take advantage of those that are poor. So God hates that. It's blasphemous. You're, so th- the exhortation is, no, he who honors him has mercy on the needy. We're, we're to honor people, if you will. They're, all of us are made in the image of God. 
And so to realize that, to, if you're a, the kind of person that looks at a person like, oh, he's poor, I don't want anything to do with him, and oh, he's rich, I want him to be my best friend, you have to be careful because you, know, you shouldn't respond to people that way. And so when you're taking advantage of somebody that's poor and can't defend themselves, if you will, in the court of law, they don't have money to get an attorney, and there's people out there that take advantage of those that are, are poor. And so this is a, a great exhortation, don't do that. Don't take advantage of those that are poor. Why? Because you are coming right against the one that made them. You're coming against God. And so you have to be careful with that. So that's a great exhortation for, for those that uh, do those things, those that take advantage of the poor. Um, it's, it's, God takes it very personally. And God says, don't do that. They're all made in the image of God. And we are to respect and honor and help when, they, when we can. Um, those in need, we talked about that on Sunday, you know, how they took care of the needs of the, the early church. Remember when they, they all came from all over 5,000 people, most of them from other different countries, they came in. Remember that we looked at on Sunday? And what did they do? They sold their possessions. They sold their lands. Why? Because they realized that they needed to help them. And I, I never really saw it this way before, and I brought this up on Sunday. I want to bring it up if you weren't here, because I think this is so important. Because if you think through that, you're like, well, why did they sell everything? And that's how the church was. No, no, it only happened that one time. Why? Very simple. Because the people that were from all over the different countries, they couldn't just go to their local church. Why? There was no local church, right? I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Why was there no local church? Well, there's no local church because the church hasn't started. It just started at Pentecost. So they had to go to be taught the word of God, to be discipled. Where did they have to go? They had to go to Jerusalem and sit under the teaching of the apostles. So you've got all these thousands of people coming in. They were dis... Their, their families probably just disowned them. So they didn't have any money. So they had to leave their property, leave their land. They had no money. They came there. And so those believers... I know I'm repeating this for some that weren't here. I want you to make sure you get this. So they, the, those that lived there in Jerusalem... They sold their properties, they sold their homes. Why? Because they wanted these people to be discipled. These Jewish people from all over that became new believers that were rejected from their families came in and they said, there's a need and we're taking care of it. And so you see that. And so tied in with this, how does it tie in with this? I don't know. No, I do know. It's needy. So those are needy. <laughs> they were in need and we're, the, the exhortation for us to know when the needs are there and know how we can help, which I know a lot of you do that and it's a wonderful thing. Verse 32, the wicked is banished in his wickedness, but the righteous has a, can we say that out loud? A refuge. I love that word. A safe place, a shelter, protection. They have hope. The wicked are banished in their wickedness. It's pretty simple. Wicked people that don't follow the ways of the Lord, they're going to be banished for all eternity and they're going to be, you know, in their wickedness, they're going to do their wicked things, and, and they're going to be banished from God forever. But you and I, we have a refuge. And so we have a refuge, yes, called heaven, but God is our refuge. He, he's a very present help in time of trouble. And so we have this refuge that we can always run into. The righteous run in, and they're what? Safe. And it's just a reminder for us as believers, we have a refuge in Christ where we can run to him and we look to him and he's our safe place. He, we can go there, you know, when we were in Israel, they had the safe rooms, you know, where they'd go in and, and for bomb shelters and all, but they, the door didn't lock, so they had to hold the door and I shared that with you. But, but we, you kind of think that was their safe place. They were able to have a safe place and all for it, as long as they, they held the, the handle and it was locked, but that was like a little refuge for them. Christ is there for us always. He is our refuge, that safe place, that protection that you and I, just a reminder, should constantly run to because he's our refuge. So you see this protection that we have, the shelter that we have, but for eternity, we have hope for all eternity. Amen? Verse 33, wisdom rests in the heart of him who has understanding. But what is in the heart of the fool is made known. And the fool's is made known. The idea of wisdom resting is it's, it's like a home. Uh, it, 
for those of us that want to understand the ways of the Lord, for those of us that are here spending time in the word of God, getting the wisdom from God, we can trust that the wisdom itself will rest in our hearts. In other words, God, it's provided for us. That God will give us wisdom in, in, you know, when we need wisdom. And so, so it rests in our heart. It's here. It's, it's not like we, you know, we have to be you know, concerned that we're not going to have wisdom for life. It, it'll rest in our hearts with what? Those of us that understand God, understand the, the will of God, that under, that. that spend time in his word. And so a wonderful picture for us that the wisdom that God gives us, it rests in us. But I, but I find also that, so we get wisdom from the word of God, but I, I find in my own life, God will cause things to happen in my life personally. Maybe this, you can relate with this, where, okay, where trouble's like right here, and like, okay, I have wisdom, but oh Lord, I don't know what to do right now. And so I get on my knees, I look to him, cry out, then he gives me wisdom for what to do for this situation. Like, thank you, Lord. And then you're like, and then all of a sudden you got this big of a problem. And then you're like, wow, that's huge. Lord, I need wisdom. I don't know what to do. Please show us, help us. And, and he gives us wisdom. And then, and then so he's actually, it's almost like, you know, people that exercise, work out. It's like, it's like wisdom. Yeah, it settles in our heart. But I believe what part of it is that God wants us to constantly look to him, constantly, you know, ask him and seek his face and, and to keep that relationship going. Because I wonder sometimes if, if life was so easy, would we spend so much time in prayer? I don't know. I know I don't have that problem. Life's not really easy. So I spend a lot of time in prayer. But again, if, if life was just so easy and so it's possible that you, we wouldn't spend that time that we need to spend at his feet in the throne room of God, seeking his face for the wisdom that he has. But it rests in our heart. And I, and I believe also what happens like day by day, God will just give us wisdom and understanding. If when we know the word of God, we know what to do, what not to do. That's the wisdom that rests in our heart. But again, just to repeat myself, there's going to be times where God will bring things in your life. And what the enemy wants you to do is when these things are so huge, he wants you to panic. And he wants you to be fearful. And he wants you to give up. And he wants you to give in. And he wants you to just say, oh, I can't do this Christian thing anymore. That's what the enemy wants you to do. But don't listen to the enemy. You know what God wants you to do? Get on your face. Seek him. Get closer to him than ever before. And watch the Lord work, not because of you, but in spite of you. He will give you wisdom from above. Why? Because in James chapter 1, it says, if anyone lacks what? Wisdom. He gives to some. He gives to all. How much? You guys are very quiet tonight. <laughs> you don't know? He gives to all liberally, generously. That means abundance. Wisdom. When we lack it, we go to him, and according to the word of God, if anyone, that means all of us, anyone of us that are believers, if you lack this wisdom that you need, we can go to God, we can go before the throne of God, and he gives to, it says all. If it said a few, or if it said most, I would tend to think most, oh, I'm not in that category, I'm not in the most category. But it doesn't say that. He gives to all. All of us generously, liberally, wisdom from above that's pure and peaceable, easy to entreat, the wisdom that God wants us to have, again, to do life itself, we can't do it without him. We need the wisdom that comes from above. So he'll rest that wisdom in your heart, but also he'll allow things to happen to mature us, to grow us, and to cause us to spend more and more time with him. The latter part of this it says, but what's in the heart of a fool is made known. Remember in Matthew chapter 12, Jesus, he delivered a man that was demon possessed. Remember the man was blind and he was mute and, 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 and Jesus healed this man. And then the Pharisee said, remember this? The Pharisee says that he cast out demons uh, by Beelz Beelzebub. Remember that? The ruler of the demons. They were accused. The, the, the religious leaders, the, the, the Pharisees were saying, oh yeah, he's, he's using Be Beelzebub to cast out the demon. Wow, that's the ruler of demons. So he's tapped into the devil, the ruler of demons. Jesus, remember? That's what they accused him of, right? So remember what Jesus said? Brood of vipers. 
He called these guys. These are the, these are the guys that, okay, come on. These are the religious leaders of the day, the, the Pharisees, the one that, did, that everyone would be like, wow, you guys are the greatest. And, you guys, and Jesus says, you're a bunch of a brood of vipers. You're a bunch of snakes, right? How can you bring evil, excuse me, how can you bring evil, being evil, excuse me, being evil, speak good things? In other words, you guys are evil, so you can't speak good things. Out of the abundance of the heart, what? They gave themselves away. There's a lady here that is, um, uh, let me, Lord, help me. To, don't want to give you too much information on this, but basically, I had to walk somewhere. This is months ago. Uh, to check something. We had the Coastal Commission here. They wanted us to put up signage and all this kind of stuff. So we just wanted to make sure they're supposed to be over there. So I walked over there, ran into this lady that caused a lot of problems in the church, a lot of big problems, even stalked us, was following us and following us home and all kinds of stuff. So then, uh, so I basically rebuked her. And then out of her mouth, she goes, you F, 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 your wife's a F, F. And she's like, and I go, Thank you. You just proved what I said. I said you're a wolf, and you just proved to me that you are a wolf by what you just said. Out of your mouth, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. And that's true. It, when, it, when it gets surfaced out, what's inside is going to come out. And typically, when you spend time with someone, it doesn't take long. I like to talk about the things of the Lord when I meet new people. I try to do that quite often. And, but I could see usually within minutes, you know right where they're at, Right? You start talking to them about the things of the Lord and all of a sudden, you, you know pretty much where they stand, pretty much. If foulness is coming out and they're cussing and swearing or whatever it is, it's just right off the bat, then you're like, whoa, you know, this, if they're a Christian, they're really not walking close right now. It's, but what, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth just pours out. And so, but for us to be careful, to realize, you know, the heart, it's foolishness that comes out, and so all the abundance. So, Lord, create in me that clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit in me. But, but here we see, again, but what is in the heart of fools is made known. People, you get it. It doesn't take long to figure it out. So, Lord, help us. When dealing with, with people in our lives, we should be different. We should speak differently. They should know that we are children of God. Because we have the living God living inside of us and he gives us wisdom that he wants to rest right in our hearts as we put our trust in him. Verse 34, I love this verse. Righteousness does what? Righteousness exalts a nation. Okay, no takers. Righteousness basically means doing what's right and godly. What does it do? It exalts a nation. Well, what does the word exalt mean? It means to lift up, to rise high, to set on high, to be exalted, to grow. It basically is talking about to a, a protection where high and lifted up, a nation is in a protective place because they are doing what's right in God's eyes. And they, there's, even prosperity comes he, that's what the word's talking, he exalts a nation. And, and I believe this country at one time was there. Righteousness exalt this nation, right? We did what was right. We, our, our founders did what was right. We started on, you know, biblical principles, our laws based on the Bible and all in school, teaching the Bible in our schools and all these things, doing what's right, doing what's right, doing what's right, exalted this nation to a place like no other nation But where are we today? Saying it's okay to mutilate children? Changing the Resurrection Sunday to something that's perverted? And it's not just this country. We're, we were like the last one there that could have, that were exalted. And we were at that place where we were that hill, if you will, shining bright for the rest of the world to see. What, what's different about that country? Let's find out what's different about them. And let's, let's do what they're doing because they're prospering. They're, there's something's going on. And it's God that was doing it. God was blessing this nation. God was pouring out on this nation. Righteousness exalts a nation. 
You think of the city of Huntington Beach. They're, in this city, they're trying to do what's right and godly and changing things and, and all. And so praise God that, that we pray that righteousness will exalt the city, that this city will be changed. Why? Because according to God's word, if you do what's right and you, you try to honor God, he'll exalt it. And without God intervening in this country, we're in big trouble. And it's very simple. This nation, all it needs to do is repent. Turn to God. One nation under God, again, if we would just be that one nation under God, a, 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 a country that just turns and says, hey, we need repentance. We need to turn to God. We need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This country can be turned around. Any country can be turned around. Why? Because it's the word of God. Righteousness will exalt your nation. If you would just turn to God, do what's right in his eyes, how do we know what's right? It's in the Bible. We're, we're allowing lawlessness. That's not godly. We're just all the things that we're allowing to, to take place, and it's like, no, no, no. There's no, you know, reproach. That word reproach, sin is a reproach to any nation. So just the opposite, and I'm afraid that's where we're at. It brings shame and disgrace upon any nation or any people. In other words, it's brought low. Another concern I have when we talk about righteousness exalting a nation, I truly believe that because Genesis chapter 12, it says that if you bless the, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I will bless you. And we've been doing that as a country for many years. What? Blessing them. And I, I personally believe that, yeah, we started off right, and we, we you know, the, the, our founding fathers, and choosing to do it God's way, and, and God exalted this nation to a place like no other nation is beautiful, but I believe even that, that because we stuck with the nation of Israel, God still kept his hand of protection and blessing on us. There was still some type of a protection, but now the, the more we pull back just recently, as we're pulling farther and farther back from doing what God wants us to do, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just saying, could this be the last straw that we're just like, that's it? Where God's like, that's it. We're not in Bible prophecy. Do you know the UN, when they were voting on, did you guys hear this? They were voting on what to do with the nation of Israel. Did you guys see that? There's a video out there. While they're doing that, there was an earthquake and the place was shaking while they were doing that. <laughs> just saying. Why? God, God's still not done with the nation of Israel. That's the apple of his eye. They don't mess with the nation of Israel. Righteousness, doing what's right, will exalt a nation. I pray this country turns. I pray that there, there is a, a huge repentance that takes place across this country. Because it's a beautiful nation that we live in that was started and founded by God-fearing God, by God men that love the Lord. And that's what exalted this wonderful nation. But now that sin comes in, it's a reproach to any people. It brings shame. And I believe, I mean, it's pretty bad when we have different countries rebuking our nation because of what we're doing, how perverse our country is. And these are leaders that don't even know God. One more verse. Verse 35 ends the chapter. The king's favor is towards a what servant? But his wrath is against him. You see another contrast here as we look at this last verse. But his wrath is against him who causes shame. To act shamefully, one who continues in sin. God's wrath is against those that reject him and continue to sin. Wrath his anger, his wrath, it'll be poured out. Uh, when you look at it globally, God's wrath, we know, will be poured out on the world. His judgment is gonna come to this world. Do you know we could be so close to that time of judgment? But the good news is, we have the escape plan, don't we? As believers, we do. I don't care, your eschatology might be different than mine. Mine is the escape plan, we're escaping. Look up because your redemption draws nigh. 
And you've been watching what's going on in Israel, right? You these attacks that's going on. You've heard even today as they're talking about the, they're on the northern border of Israel. More troops are gathered together, Russian troops, on the, in Syria, like they haven't had in a very long time. Interesting. Joined up with Iran, Russia, joined up with Turkey. They're, they have that military alliance. Sounds a lot like Ezekiel 38 to me. And my belief, my understanding for the rapture of the church to take place, I believe it's going to happen either before that Gog of Magog attack that's going to happen when those nations come in and, and, and they're from the northern border where they're already at, there, waiting. I believe that the rapture will probably happen just before that, or we might see the beginning stages of it, but then the rapture. Why? Because in Ezekiel 39, God says, then I will pour out my spirit upon the nation of Israel. I know I've mentioned this before, but guys, do you realize the days that we're living in? I, I want to be in this category. I want the favor of my king of kings. I want to be a wise servant that, that does it his way. Why? Because his wrath is going to be poured out on a Christ-rejected world, the, those that reject him. And we could be living in that day. I'm not saying we are. But we very well could be living in the time where the rapture of the church takes place, where you and I, who are alive and remain, will be caught up together with the Lord in the air, and we shall forever be with who? With the Lord. I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but let me tell you, we are living in a day where things are stirring up in Israel. And when you look at the Bible, it's not, what's going on in America? What's going on in Italy? Well, a little bit. Rome, that's, that's in there, but... Right? Mexico. What's going on in Mexico? Sorry, that's not in there. What's going on in the nation of Israel? Oh, according to God's word, God will bring them back into their land against all odds, and they will become a nation again. And once they become a nation again, they'll be fruitful, and they'll multiply, and they'll, they'll have abundance, and they'll prosper. Oh, then what happens? Ezekiel 38, nations will come against them, primarily Russia, Iran, Turkey, and other Muslim nations, and they will come down and attack the nation of Israel, and God himself will protect them. God himself and Israel will turn and they'll look to the very one that they pierced, according to prophecy. And... Check it out. You know this. The nations of the world will know that it's God that protected them. And I hope and I pray that my eschatology is right when it comes to the rapture because my hope is, according to the timeline in there, the rapture can happen maybe right before that battle takes place, the Ezekiel 38 battle, or right at the beginning. But I know for sure when God intervenes, I believe this with all my heart, God is going to turn again and he's going to pour out as it says, then they will turn to him and he will pour out his spirit. And I pray and I hope that means that we're out. But then God will pour out his wrath. There's seven years of judgment that will take place on the world. And I hold on to scripture that tells me we can escape that wrath. Because God has not appointed us to wrath. That's our God. Believe me, the time of tribulation is the wrath of God and the wrath of, of Jesus poured out. We won't be here. I am so grateful. Why? Because during that seven years of tribulation that will take place on this earth, all hell will break loose. It'll be a living hell here. And you don't want to be here. My question are you rapture ready? Have you accepted Jesus? Let me ask you this question. Are you excited about Jesus Christ coming to take us away at any time? Yes. Amen. So am I. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for the days that we live in. Lord, we do. We look up. We know that our redemption draws so near. Lord, I pray for all of us that are believers, Lord, that we would be those wise servants, Lord God, that we would serve you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, we pray, Lord, that uh, many in these days would come to know you. We pray, Lord God, for our family. We pray for our friends that don't know you. Lord, we pray that you would draw them, that there would be that wonderful drawing 
of your Holy Spirit in their lives. Again, Lord, use us, all of us that are believers, Lord. Lord, these upcoming days, I pray that we would apply these wonderful truths of your word, that we wouldn't just be hearers of your word. Lord God, help us to do those things. And lastly, Lord, we pray for any in this room, downstairs, or watching, Lord, online, Lord, if they don't know you, Lord God, we pray today, tonight, would be their night, their day of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.